So tonight, inshallah, you know, it'll be a little bit unfiltered. You know, I'll speak from the heart, shoot from the hip, whatever they call it. Um, because, I mean, this hits home for me. And uh, I think it does for, for most of us here. So uh, here goes, inshallah ta'ala, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and get started right away. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, taught us in the Quran, you know, there's a, a particular ayah. And I think it sums up the responsibility of parenting for all of us. How many people here consider themselves to be parents? Well, that's most of us, right? How many of us plan to become parents, inshallah ta'ala? One day. Yeah. That's the rest. How many people are sociopaths? See? Not a, not a single hand. Right? So we're either parents or inshallah ta'ala we plan to become parents. And so there's an ayah in, in, in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sums up the responsibility of parenting. Okay? If you ask the average parent, what's your job? Some people will say, well, my job is to put food in their bellies. My job is to put clothes on their backs or a roof over their heads. My job is to send them to Stanford. My job is to get them married. All of that is important, but it's not the primary job of a parent. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayuha ladheena amanu, qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. O you who believe, protect yourselves first and foremost, and your families from the fire. The fire of hell. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his protection. It would not make any sense. I think, in fact, it would be the absolute most difficult moment of your existence if you're standing by the gates of Jannah and you're missing some of your children. You're looking right and you're looking left and they're not there to be with you in that moment as you celebrate. So I think of myself, you know, as a father, and alhamdulillah, I have three children. You know, two of them are grown. You know, one of them is still a teenager. Um, I, I, I think that my job is primarily to protect them, okay? And a lot of people protect their kids from hunger. They protect their kids from poverty. They protect their kids from, you know, uh, muggers. They protect their kids from whatever outside scary forces around us. But you have to protect their hearts and you have to protect their faith and you have to protect their akhirah as well, right? That's our job as parents. And, you know, when I was a kid, and the Shaykh al masjid used to tell us the hadith, يَأْتِي عَلَىٰ أُمَّتِي زَمَانٌ يَكُونُ الْقَابِضُ فِيهِ عَلَىٰ دِينِهِ كَالْقَابِضِ عَلَىٰ جَمْرٍ مِنْ نَعْ A time will come for this ummah when people who hold on tight to their faith, it's as if they're holding on to a little flame of fire in the fist of their hands. And I never understood what he meant by that. Because, you know, I was a kid, I grew up in a Muslim country, masjid was around the corner, most of my acquaintances and my friends were very religious people. You know, my parents were religious. I had three or four shayukh that I studied with. Life was good. I never understood what it means to be holding on tight to your faith until I saw my kids going through their teenage years. That's when I realized what it meant for someone to have received nurture and love, Islamic education, care at home. Both parents are devout Muslims. And the minute they go out there in society, they are faced with this challenge every single day. Do I choose dunya or do I choose akhirah? Every day they face those challenges, right? I was sitting in my office one of those days, and a lady showed up with no appointment. And I try to make sure that counseling sessions are done by appointment only. Otherwise, I'll be doing counseling nine hours a day, okay? And so this sister showed up, and something in my heart, you know, told me that I needed to, to actually talk to her and let her in. So I asked the office manager, just let her in. I want to talk to her. So she comes sobbing, and she tells me about her son, okay? This is a kid that grew up in the masjid, Sunday school, memorized half the Quran, good on his deen, right? Hamamatul masjid, you know, from the hadith, the little pigeon of the masjid. You know, these kids are just running around every single day in the masjid. You're like, man, these kids even have homes? Do you guys have parents? Like, who is this kid's dad, right? Like, you see these kids around the masjid all the time. Years after years after years, okay? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always keep the beautiful, delightful voice of our children in the masajid. Allahumma ameen. And may, may the little noise that the kids make never cease to exist from our masajid. Because a masjid that does not have kids making noise in the background is a masjid that is bent on destructing itself. 
this is a masjid that is going through extinction. Because it is those kids, inshallah ta'ala, that one day, you know, by the way, I always tell my community, you can tell the kids that don't come to the masjid ever. Those are the rowdiest kids. But the solution is not to stop bringing them to the masjid. The solution is to bring them more frequently. And you see the level of rowdiness kind of, you know, scales down over the weeks and the months because they start learning the adab and the etiquette of being in Allah's house. The solution is, and the solution is, is not for us to frown and to be upset, you know, as elders, oh my God, control your kids and all these things that we say to hurt parents and discourage them from bringing their kids to the masjid, never do that. Have sabr in your salah, it's okay. The kids are running around collecting all the cell phones, right? Collecting all the sunglasses, you know, putting them in their pockets, it's okay. Taking all the key chains, making noise in the back, this is a sign of health. It's a sign of health in your masjid if that happens. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these kids in, in a couple of years, you know, they'll become, you know, the beautiful birds, the pigeons that are flying in the masjid, right? So this kid was one of them. You know, grew up in this Muslim family, homeschooled, right? They protected him from everything. And I'm going to, like I said, I, I, I'm going to speak from the heart tonight. I'm going to say things that will shock you, all right? This kid, literally, the, two months into college, two months, he gets to know, of course, this, this whole world that was kept from him, this entire existence, that he realized that his parents lied, you know, life at home and at the masjid, this is not how the world is. No TV, no internet at home, totally sheltered. Goes to college, two months. And then the sister came to me and she said, my son decided to become a transgender woman. Two months. And lost his faith and beca became atheist. And I still remember her words, you know, resonating in my head. You know, she used these words and I quote, I lost my son to the wolves. I lost my son to the wolves. You know, as parents, when we used to have little kids, what is a parent's worst fear? It's for you to be at the uh, department store and your kid disappears, right? At the mall, kid disappears. And I was in, I was in Dubai, like, you know, about 10 years ago. My son, Adam, mashallah, he's, he's 17, just turned 17 a couple of years ago, a couple of, couple of days ago. 10 years ago, we were in Dubai, and then he disappeared in a mall for an hour and a half. Hour and a half, right? You disagree with the Emiratis on everything, but security at the mall is awesome, right? You know, they, they would never let a kid out of the mall. So, you know, we kept looking and looking and looking. And someone said, you know, go to the entrance. And we go to the, all the entrances and we found like one of the security guards. Have him next to him or gave him some candy. It was this really nice Bengali guy. Gave him candy and, you know, just took care of him. Right? That's the, the a parent's worst fear is to lose your son or lose your child. Okay? You know what's worse than that? It's for the wolves to come and snatch your kid from under your hands. And, and serve them for dinner. That is going to be a lot worse. It's for you as a parent to think that my job was to protect my kids and I failed miserably. And my kid was taken away from me because I did not do enough at home. So that still, that resonated in my head. I was, you know, some counseling sessions for us, imams, they have to be, we need to be a little bit, you know, distant. If I am way too emotionally involved with every counseling session, I'll be miserable 24-7. Because you let the negative emotions internalize. And if I am way too distant and completely disconnected, then I'm being insensitive, right? I'm being callous. You know, the imam doesn't care. So I have to walk this very fine line where I do care, but I don't care too much. Otherwise, it start affecting my own life, okay? But wallahi, brothers and sisters, that session, I was miserable for a week. I was miserable for a week. And then I'm sitting on the dinner table, you know, just sitting there kind of like thinking about what happened a week later. And my daughter, Zainab, who was, you know, at that time, I told you, I'm going I'm to share with you stuff from my own private life because this is the premise of the book that I had to write. This is super personal, okay? This is not some intellectual exercise for me. This is something that I had to deal with personally, with my own children, right? A week after the wolf story, my daughter comes on the di dinner table and we're done. Dad, I want to talk to you about something. I mean, what, what's the worst that could it be? You know, kids have things to tell, okay? So my, my wife is removing all the, the food and, you know, the, the, the plates and the pots and everything from the table. And my daughter just sat there, uh, Dad, um, 
I was talking to one of my friends at college today, and you know, she said certain things about God, and it made a lot of sense to me. I was like, wait, you're just like a Christian friend of yours? Was this like Jehovah's Witness? Like, was it the Mormons saying things about God? She, actually, no, it's the opposite. She was an atheist, and, and she established to me, and she used these words, established to me that God doesn't exist. What do you think? Wallahi, brothers and sisters, you know when you're having a heart attack, but you're pretending to be okay, right? My heart just sank, and I'm just sitting there like, you know, the beads of sweat. But I'm just like, you know, playing it cool. I was like, huh, interesting. What kind of friend what is that? You know, how, how long have you known them? Well, you know, just, you know, since, since the semester started, really good person, supportive. Right, non-judgmental, very nice, very open, very inclusive. Okay, we have to be like this, right? We have to be super inclusive and super compassionate and super loving, just so that the fitna becomes even worse and more difficult. <laughs> Subhanallah. If they were difficult and judgmental and edgy, it would have been easy. Ah, just, these are bad people. But they're some sometimes they're the best people, right? So nice, you know, supportive. So I said, um, okay, interesting. So what did she say? What did she say about God? She said that the universe could exist perfectly fine without God. We don't need God. So I was like, interesting. So she's saying that the universe caused itself to exist? Well, I mean, she, said, she just said that the universe has been around forever, and it doesn't matter. The universe does not need God. Okay? How many of you would think that the universe has been around forever? See, like by nature, because we're people of faith, we believe that the universe was caused. All right? So I sat there and I was like, okay, how do I do this? I'm trying to be calm, you know? There is fire in my heart, but I'm trying to be calm. So, so I said, um, there is a moment that we are in right now. Okay? She said, yes. This moment is preceded by another moment that caused the current moment. She said, yes. And there's a moment yesterday that caused the moment of today. She said, yes. And there's a moment the day before that caused the moment of today. All right? If time goes back infinitely, then where was the initial event that caused every other event to exist? And I'm, I'm just saying this, and I did not know that there's a philosophical term for this. It's called, you know, infinite regression of causes is impossible. Okay? Write this down if you're taking any notes. This is what you need to be researching. The infinite regression of causes is, is, is impossible. There has to be a starting event. And I removed everything from the table. All right? I removed everything from the table. And I asked her to close her eyes. And then I, I, I took a, uh, a spoon and I put it on the table. And I asked her to open her eyes. Zainab, what do you see on the table? She said, I see a spoon. Okay? Close your eyes again. I removed the spoon. Put it on the kitchen counter. Open your eyes. What do you see? Nothing. Just an empty table. You automatically assume when you have seen a spoon and now there is no spoon, you automatically assume what? That someone must have removed the spoon. And before that, someone must have put the spoon on the table. Okay? So, show me one event in the entire universe that is not caused by something else. So she kept thinking everything was caused by something. Everything is, as they say, as philosophers say, contingent upon something else. Every event, every object is contingent, depends on its existence, in its existence on something else. Show me, Zainab, one thing in the entire universe that caused itself, that is not caused by anything else. She said, well, I can't, I can't really think of anything. So I told her, well, what is the universe? She said, the universe is, is the world. I said, no, the universe is just a made-up word for all the contingent things. The universe is the projection of the mind upon reality. Every, the chair and the table and the human being and the frog and the mountain and the star and the galaxy, these are all components. When we put them all together, we call it what? We call it the universe, right? Everything that exists. If everything in the universe was caused, then what do you think happened to the universe itself? She's like, hmm. And, and I started seeing doubt in her face about what the girl said. And she said, actually, that's a pretty good point. 
if the universe is caused, then we have to ask ourselves, who caused it? Otherwise, it caused itself, and that would not make any sense. All right, Zainab, it's okay. Just, you know, think about it. And I'm being super dismissive, you know, acting cool. Think about it. And then we just had some sweets and watched a little TV. And then I went, I went to my room. It's just, you know, like the movies, when you're acting super cool and you go into your bedroom and you close the door. And like, oh, my God. I swear to God, that's exactly what happened to me. And my wife was standing there, and I just like almost ne ne nearly had a, a nervous breakdown. And I was like, I, I can't believe that, that I actually pulled this off. I preserved the concept of God in my daughter's heart tonight. Okay? Now, alhamdulillah, you know, Zainab is, 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 is hijabi. You know, she's at the masjid. She's super involved. And she tells everyone, you know, I was saved by a spoon. That has become her story. My faith was saved by a spoon, right? So that's a, that's a great conversation starter. Like, you know, my, oh my God, to tell me the story. And this is how she starts talking to people about faith. So I went through these dinner table conversations with, with my daughter for months and months and months. My other kids are listening very, very attentively, right? Um, until, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, I started seeing, you know, very positive change in her and so forth. She maintained her prayers because, you know, she wasn't sure. And she maintained the appearances. Bismillah. Someone really doesn't like what we're saying right now. <laughs> Bismillah. Was that one of the kids? I told you. These are the kids you want to have around the masjid, by the way. Wallahi, I'm not even joking. These mischievous kids, they become the leaders of the future. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them. Um, so, you know, anyway, you know, I went through everything with, with my daughter. And then at some point, alhamdulillah, you know, her, her faith is very, very strong. But the point is, I, I started encouraging this type of debate at home. And I started having conversations with the kids about everything. Nothing was, was, was you know, off, uh, off the table. And then the whole rise of the LGBTQ movement started kind of imposing itself on our conversations as well. And I, Lord Almighty, the, the, the amount of conversations that we've had at home about this was absolutely extensive. Now, alhamdulillah, I, can, I could say with comfort and ease that my kids, alhamdulillah, are out of the bottleneck. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for every single one of you to feel that at some point or the other. To feel that your kids, alhamdulillah, they're out of the water, right? With Allah's grace, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this is, this is also a very emotional exercise for me because it took a massive toll on me over like two years. And I think it was particularly difficult because I have, you know, even though all of my shuyukh were, were uh, uh, Shafi'is and Ash'aris and so forth, you know, my shuyukh believed in using reason and logic, you know, to defend the concept of God and you know, you know the, the, the writings of Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, you know, Maqalat al islamiyin and all these books that became the foundation, you know, of, of philosophical argumentation and ilm al-kalam in the Islamic tradition. I actually grew up leaning more towards Ibn Taymiyyah's views on aqidah in particular. And that is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is nur that lights in the heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not something that can be proven by logic and reason, it's something that is felt. It's something that is discovered. Ibn Taymiyyah, by the way, even though he was opposed to you know, philosophical argumentation, I think that he weaved some of the most incredible foundations of Islamic philosophy in his writings. And so I grew up opposed to the idea of making God into a necessity. Because I found joy in the choice of faith. When you make God into a necessity, like the table and the chair, like a truth, a fact that cannot be disputed, you've taken the fun out of faith, right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us becomes like the table and the chair. You know, it's, it's there. I know it's there. God is there. I know he's there. This, this is not, faith requires a leap. Faith requires a choice. Faith is voluntary action. Is you saying, you know what? You know, the idea of God is not only plausible, the idea of God is very, very likely. And that is more than enough for someone to have faith and to say, you know, I choose God. The Ash'aris and the Maturidis, they want the, the necessity. They want the undisputed evidence of God. So I, I grew up not liking that, you know, train of thought as much. 
but I found myself using Ash'ari methodologies with my kids all the time. And then, you know, so I go to Sheikh Muhammad Kamil. I don't know if you guys know him. One of the foremost scholars in Sacramento and my Sheikh. You know, so I go to him and say, Sheikh, I, I feel like weird. I feel a little bit hypocritical because I'm using Ash'ari ideas. But then, you know, I am in my Aqeedah, I'm kind of more of on the Salafi side, right? And I mean Salafi, by the way, in its essential ancient, uh, you know, uh, 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 academic sense, not in the sense that we use it today, right? Because Salafi today is kind of like, you know, you're, it's, a, it's, a, it's an attack on someone, right? But that, so I use it in its very academic sense. So he said to me, Ibn Taymiyyah and his work start when people are already solid in their faith. But those who are on the margins and those who need to be brought into the fold, maybe you can use Ash'ari work and Ash'ari methodology to bring them in. And once you've brought them in, then it becomes a matter of taking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on faith, right? My daughter then came to me and she said that this was really an incredible journey. You need to write about this. Because imagine other people out there that, you know, whose faith could be saved. I was like, right? Oh my God. I don't have a, a five minutes in the day to write anything. I barely write my tasks for the following day. What do you mean write? Because that's what imams are, right? It's just the putting out fires. You know, when someone asks me, what do you do most of the day? I tell them I'm putting out fires. That's what imams do. Managing crises. Managing trouble and problems in the Muslim community, right? Very little time, you know, for us to study and learn and read and grow and, 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 you know, do our own spiritual stuff. Very, very difficult. And then you plop in your bed at the end of the day like a dead person. Barely wake up for Fajr. You drag your feet because you're so tired and exhausted physically and mentally, right? Imams are not superhumans, right? You know, I, 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 I wish that there is a, 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 a therapy service that imams can sign up for. <laughs> because everyone comes to them, you know, dumps the, 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 the negative energy Right, seeks that help, but where would imams go? They just talk to each other. You'd be, um, you'd be shocked to see the kind of, kinds of things that imam, imams say to each other behind back doors. Right? It's a lot of, and, and they, they complain that imams are foodies, right? What, what else are you going to do? This is how you manage the negative energy, just to enjoy food, right? Um, so there's a reason why imams love food. That's my theory, at least. So she said, "Hey, you need to you need to write a book." It's like how how am I how am I get time to write a book? So I was in Istanbul, you know, like about six months later, and uh, you know I met some brothers over there. It was a it was a trip where we were we were invited actually to to Istanbul by you know uh, by the Turkish government, and. And I met some, some brothers from a publishing company. It's called Claritas. And, you know, how many of you know Maher Zain and Awakening? So the owners of Awakening are the owners of Claritas. It's the same people, right? Um, and so they, they, they were on the trip, and they both came to me, and they said, we've been following your lectures and your YouTube channel and your khatiras in Ramadan. You need to write. So I said, and if I wrote, will you publish? He said, yes. You know, I, I, we can't promise you, but the, 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 the project has to be worthy. But if it is, you have my word, we'll publish it. And then my daughter's words resonated in my head. You know, she asked me to write. What if I just start? Let's see if I can put a chapter together. So I started playing this trick that really worked. And Allah, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, if you have original ideas and you're intimidated by writing a book, it's a lot easier than you think. Okay? All I did was I took my laptop with me everywhere I went. One day would pass, and I don't get a chance to write at all. But another day, I'll be waiting at my doctor's office. And I have seven minutes before I see the doctor. So what do I do? Take the laptop out, and I do one paragraph. And then I put the laptop back, right? The following day, I'm at the car dealership. You know, my car is getting fixed, and I have an hour. What do I do? Take the laptop out, two paragraphs. I'd be at my brother's house waiting for my sister-in-law to make dinner, right? And she's fixing the dinner table and everything. And I have like literally seven, eight minutes before I eat. And then I, I, I write one paragraph. Within like two weeks, I finished one chapter. I was like, wait a second. This is not bad. 
And then I won another chapter and another chapter and another chapter. And then within one year, I finished the book. So I submitted the draft to the Claritas boys. And, you know, again, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants something to work, you know, they, they send you the, the signs right away. So I get a, a response on WhatsApp five minutes later, and it says, finally, exclamation mark. They did not even read the manuscript. They just said, finally. And then I said, Zakallah khair for your support. Please read it. Let me know if this is worthy of publication. It took like about two months before I received another message. And you know what? I did not bother them. I was like, if Allah wants it to work, it'll work. So they sent me a message two months later. We have some comments about a few chapters. Can we have a Google Meet or a Zoom call, whatever? So I said, absolutely. When? He says, Sunday. So I sat there at Pete's Coffee with these brothers on a Sunday. And, you know, from London, they're telling me, hey, adjust this, remove that. This, this paragraph didn't make sense. Rewrite this. Took me another two and a half months to work on the draft, and I submitted draft number two. You know, their uh, editorial board sent me some comments. Weirdest comment was, you need to redo the whole thing in British English. So I was like trying to figure out how to do that on Google Docs, right? How to redo this whole thing in British English and, and all of that. And alhamdulillah, you know, just I figured it out, and then I redone the whole thing in British English, and then I submitted it. And that's when they said, it's good to go. We just need to wait for a date for the publication. And alhamdulillah, from that date, it took about a year and a half for me to hold a copy in my hands. Right? That's the story of the book. And it encouraged me so much that thus far, I've submitted a manuscript for the second book. And I'm almost done with the third. And they approved it without even looking at any of the details. Alhamdulillah. So... By the summer of next year, I will have, inshallah ta'ala, with Allah's grace, three books uh, that I have authored, again, based on my own experience and, and the things that I've done with, with the community. I wanted to share with you some stats because, you know, I don't want you to think this problem affects everybody else, but it's not going to affect my family and my kids, all right? Everyone knows what Gen Z is, right? You know what Gen Z is, all right? Gen Z? Raise your hand if you know what Gen Generation Z is. Some of the brothers are like, Gen Z, is this like Pakistani food? You know what Generation Z is? What is Generation Z? Anyone wants to define Generation Z? Those who are born in the 2000s, right? One-fifth of Generation Z, according to statistics, uh, identifies as unaffiliated. You know what that means? They don't follow any of the religions. Okay? Most of the unaffiliated is essentially atheist. All right? It's just euphemism for atheist. All right? But here's the kicker. Also, one-fifth of Generation Z identifies with, with the LGBTQ community. One fifth, which means that one out of every five members of that generation is both atheist and identifies with the LGBTQ community. Okay. How many? What is the percentage of of American Muslims that identifies as converts? Anyone wants to guess? Percentage. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty-four percent. The Pew, the Pew research shows that when you sample the Muslim community in America, about 24% of us will say that they've converted to Islam. Amazing, right? How many of us actually leave Islam on an annual basis? Muslims that grew up in Muslim households and they reached adulthood, meaning that they passed 18 and then they decided to renounce Islam. What's the percentage? 23%. Thank you. We gain every year 24% of our numbers, and we lose almost the same number every single year. So it's a wash. The Muslim community in America is almost not growing because the number of people that come is equivalent to the number of people that leave. That's pretty frightening. Okay? It could get worse, by the way, if we start bleeding more people than the people are converting. And, and here's the thing. People that, that leave Islam are kids that grew up in Muslim households raised by Muslim parents. These are not converts that decided to leave Islam. 
They're kids whose parents are born Muslim. Those kids are born Muslim. So the savagery of, of the statistics is a lot worse when you think about it. SubhanAllah. By the way, what does that tell you? If you have 100 kids, you know, I mentioned that to, you know, some of the students in my halakha, and I told them, because many of them are Sunday school teachers, I told them, if you have 100 kids enrolled in Sunday school, I just want you to imagine that you're looking at those kids and you know that 24 out of 100 are going to become atheist one day. See how frightening that is. You see how frightening that is? All these beautiful kids coming to Sunday school, right? Filling the masjid with energy. I just want you to imagine for a second that you're going to lose 24 of every 100. 48 of every 200. That's almost 50 kids. The average Sunday school here, you know, MCA or SBIA is how many kids? A lot more than 200, I can tell you that. Right? So imagine if you have 300 kids enrolled in Sunday school, it is possible that you're going to lose 75 of them. See how frightening that is? Okay? This is hitting us all at home. This is not something... You know, this is happening out there in the world. It's something that is at our doorstep already, brothers and sisters. And I wanted to say that, you know, atheism is not always very blatant. It's not always, you know, you go to college and the, the atheism club, you know, they have a little uh, da'wah table, right, with all of their brochures telling you, this is why God doesn't exist. No. The vast majority of the time, it's not so in your face like this. There is atheism, and then there is atheistic culture. Our culture in America has become an atheistic culture. It's a culture that removes God already from everything, and ultimately makes God a dismissible thought. God is not important. I want you to examine the amount of death and darkness and despair in popular American songs today. It's mind-boggling how depressing the lyrics have become. All about purposelessness, all about aimlessness, lack of meaning, lack of direction. It is, we're all just tiny little particles being thrown around by nothing. Okay? You see that culture of atheism infused in popular culture. You see it infused in the movies. You see it infused in soap operas, infused in TV shows. You see it infused in social media around you. It's everywhere. And it starts determining everything. Why is there such a massive mental health crisis in America today? Because God essentially died in their hearts already, even if they're still going to church. God for them is dead. Practically dead. There is some tiny little rope of faith that they're holding on tight to, but practically speaking, God is already gone in their minds. There's nothing. There's nothing to live for. There's nothing to wake up in the morning for. There is nothing to fight for. You know, I keep thinking to myself, you know, as Muslims, when we have a really bad day and we are religious, devout people, what do we do? We pray, right? Oh my God, you know, it's Isha. I really need to do my salah. You know, rain or shine, I'll do my salah, right? And then when you do your salah, you make dua, maybe you cry a little bit in your sujood. You know, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for relief. I feel a little bit better. You listen to, you know, uh, your favorite qari on, on the way home from work. You feel a little bit better. You come to Jum'ah and the Imam, mashallah, suddenly uses the right hadith and it, it hits the right button and suddenly you feel inspired. Oh man, the Imam is as if he was talking to me today. How often do you hear that? Right? Because you need that faith to help you recover. Okay? Or if, if you have a really bad year, what do you do? Got to go to Umrah, right? Got to go to Umrah. So I've been having a really, really bad year. I have really, I, I, my eyes, I just miss the Kaaba so much. I have to be there. I have to be in the Masjid Nabawi. I have to be there for Fajr, right? I want you to imagine if someone took all that away from you. You have no recourse. You have no process to mitigate your pain. You have no meaning. You have nothing to look forward to. Even if life, your entire journey was so bad and so difficult, you say what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will level the fields on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Maybe some of the valimeen, they will live and they will die with their dhulm. And they were not crushed by God. And some of the mazlumeen, they will live in oppression and die in oppression. But at the end of the day, your heart tells you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it all right one day. If not in this dunya, 
I will take what is mine on, on the day of judgment when I stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and complain to my Lord. Imagine that they've taken that away from you. You have nothing to live for, not for the hour or for the day or the month or the year, and your entire life means absolutely nothing. You're dancing the line of suicide every single day. Do I need to live or do I need to take my own life? What's the point? There's no point. Oh, my mom wants me to help her with this uh, you know, upcoming procedure. Okay, I'm going to live a, an extra two weeks. Uh, my spouse really depends on me. It's going to totally suck if I killed myself right now. My kids are still a little bit young. You know what? I can wait until they graduate high school. Literally, you're looking for reasons to live. Because if they have extinguished the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from your heart, nothing is left. This is how dangerous and destructive atheism is. And here's the thing. I've had my own faith issues growing up. But the more I studied, and the more I got involved in Islamic philosophy, and the more I've looked at what the scholars have said, the more I've read the Ash'aris, and the more I've read Imam Maturidi, and the more I've, I, I've studied Juwaini, and the more I've studied Ibn Thamiya, you know, you kind of collect, you know, this plethora of knowledge over the years. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, every single argument against God has already been addressed. Every single refutation of God's existence has already been addressed and crushed. Atheism is an industry. It's an industry that thrives and it wants to thrive. It preaches like religion. Atheism replaces one metaphysics with another metaphysics. You replace the idea, I believe in God, with the idea, I don't believe in God. Both essentially are what? Both are faith. Both are a religion. The religion of atheism is not the absence of faith. The religion of atheism, it's an alternative. It's a different type of faith. That is essentially what it is. Now with all of this happening in the world around us, what is happening in our masajid? Are we equipped for this fight? We are in so much trouble. We're in so much trouble. I just want you to study what the Imams teach and preach. Look at the subject matter addressed at the programs and the seminars and the workshops at the Masajid. Right? Look at the conversations that happen at the Masjid. These high school kids, they have all the temptations in the world. The girls and the boys are throwing themselves on them. They're being invited to explore all forms of sexuality and lusts and, and pleasure out there in the world. They're being invited to do drugs. They're being invited to, uh, you know, practice the absolute most decadent things. They are being faced with atheism every single day. Live your life however way you want. God doesn't exist. And then when they come to the masjid, what do they see? They see masjid infighting. They see masjid politics. They see imams being mistreated. They, they see board fights. They see people calling the police and removing each other from the masjid. They see, you know, is music halal or haram? Can I eat at McDonald's and in and out? That's what they see. They see moon fighting. It's not moon sighting, it's moon fighting, right? I mean, things have gotten a little bit better, right? But this is what they experience at the masjid. And they gradually think, you know what? What am I doing here? My parents, they're immigrants. You know, they're here because they have to be here. That's their culture. That's who they are. That's not me. There is nothing for me at the masjid. And what do they do? They're going to go find some affiliation, some group to belong to, because every human being needs something to belong to. Right? You see how, how dangerous our situation is? We're in so much trouble, you know, as I said to you. And I want to go through a very quick list here of things from my own experience that lead to shaking people's faith. All right? This is going to be a long list, but I'm going to go through it quickly. Number one. Being dismissive of science, when parents start saying like things like, um, you know, the theory of evolution, this is just fiction. Don't believe in these things. That's when your kids are going to stop taking you seriously right away. They're going to think my, my parents are just not sophisticated enough. They are dismissing science. It's not the way to have these conversations. All right. So you dismiss the theory of evolution. You dismiss the Big Bang. You dismiss science because... You think that it is opposed to your faith. 
That's not the way to go, all right? They will dismiss you in a second. And I've always said this, by the way, and I say it again. If your kids think that you are intellectually inferior to them, you're dead as a parent. If your kids think they're smarter than you, and they are intellectually superior to you, you're dead as a parent. You're done. If you're so far behind, you know, in your awareness of society and culture and knowledge, you're done. Your ability to parent your children has essentially come to a halt. Number two, the problem of evil. How could a beautiful, loving, merciful God allow for so much pain to happen in the world, including the death and the carnage of little children. This is responsible single-handedly for about 90% of the cases of atheism. And it is so simple to respond to. It is the easiest one to respond to. But it looks at face value so powerful. Yeah, that's right. If there is a God, why is he allowing for all these terrible things to happen in the world? Right? Sexual deviations. Naturally, when people want to become transgender or, you know, uh, become homosexual or whatever, they know that that is not accepted in their faiths. You know what? If God says that I cannot be myself, then I reject that God. There's no such thing. God is a fiction. It becomes very easy for people to dismiss faith on sexual grounds. Like I said earlier, another factor is the irrelevance of religious teachings. Religious teachings are not relevant to their lives. They're not helping them answer their own questions on a day-to-day -day basis, right? The other one is phones and social media. Why social media? Because social media is essentially designed to disconnect you from your natural support system. It's designed by definition to keep you engaged for as long as possible. And social media algorithms have become so effective that they will literally get, gauge how many extra fraction of a second you're spending on one particular post in order to do what? To feed you more of that same stuff. So you get caught up in desire. You get caught up in your own preferences. You get caught up in your own wild fantasies. And social media, the more it does this, it disconnects you from reality. It disconnects you from masjid, from family, from your natural support system puts you in a little chamber where you're only hearing your own voice. This is how you lose your faith. The next point is the unrestrained flood of information. A lot of people may not think of this one. Okay? The human mind is not designed to be exposed to too much information every single day. A flood in China, an earthquake in Iran, people that died in mass shootings in Minnesota. Oh my God! We're not, our minds are not designed to receive so much information. Okay? In fact, all the traditional institutions were designed to restrict the flow of information. Right? To restrict the flow of unhealthy information. Take, for example, our parents. What did they tell us when we were little kids? We can talk about these things, but we cannot talk about the, these other things. This subject is only for adults. You can't read this book. You can't watch this movie, right? Remember when parents were actually parents? And they used to follow the guidelines? Oh, this is PG-13. Uh, you're 11. You can't. <laughs> okay. You know, you know how it is today, though. PG-13 and R, they're all the same. They're putting you the poison and the honey. Even, even little harmless, innocuous cartoon movies for five-year-olds putting the seeds in there. And those seeds just take a few years to blossom. And now you accept these new realities, right? You know, when we were maybe like 20 years ago, they would, they would slip in the movies these effeminate male characters. Do you know what I'm talking about? When we grew older and we look at those, you know, we watch, re -watch the movies from the mid-90s, it's like, oh my God, how did I not notice this? The movie is filled with homosexual themes. But at the time, it just looked like, oh, this male character, they're just acting like a girl. Not a big deal. But they were preparing our minds so that when we turn 25 and 30, we perfectly accept it because it just becomes part of your upbringing, right? So the mind is not designed for the flood of information. My advice to you, 
stay off social media as much as possible. Be intentional in your usage of social media, all right? With every electronic device, in fact, with every device in general, we're always very intentional. We ask ourselves, what do I need this device for? I get in my car, I need to have a destination. I just, I don't get in my car and drive randomly. It seems that the only technology where we engage with, without any intentionality whatsoever, is social media. Because going through posts and the perpetual, uh, you know, surfing is an end in and of itself. So when you go on social media, ask yourself, what am I doing on YouTube? There is a lecture for Sheikh Yasser Qadi that I need to listen, that someone sent me. You know, there is this particular video that I need to watch. I need to reshare the post from the event at the masjid. Do your job, get out of social media. I don't have any apps of social media on my phone. I have it on my computer. And I only go when I need to. And I am always logged out. So half the time, I go on Facebook because I'm just sitting in, in my office bored. And I go on Facebook, I realize that I'm logged out. And I'm like, oh man. Astaghfirullah. You know, have some shame and I stop. Unless I really need to post something, that's when I go and I log in and I make it more difficult for myself. Definitely remove it from your phone and have it on one computer, not on every single device. Okay, this is how they, they get you. Tablet, computer, laptop, all of it. This is how they get you. Remove it and leave it on only one device and go intentionally when you absolutely need to. Don't keep watching the news and following Twitter and all the horrific events that are happening in the world, the mind is not designed for this, all right? <clears throat> Emphasis on STEM. Oh man, this is my favorite. Emphasis on STEM, science and engineering with our kids. That's all we want. We want our kids to be scientific, to do math, to do physics, to go to engineering schools and stuff like that. And what is lost in the process? The humanities, history, social sciences, philosophy, the very tools that they're actually going to need to realize that there's more to the world than hard materialism. Science prepares the mind to handle the material. It's a useful tool, but it cannot be the only thing that we use. The mind needs rhetoric. The mind needs liberal arts. The mind needs history, needs poetry, right? We need art. This is how you realize that there's more to the world than material things. Faith is eroded when all you have is just material sciences. So you have to be very, very careful with this. <coughs> <coughs> Last but not least, atheism thrives in an environment where history is taught as facts and not lessons. What does that mean? One of the things that I've always wondered about when I was younger, when I was still in grad school, is why is it that Christian Europe, you know, after Constantine, so you're talking about 300 after Christ, about 300 years before the Prophet why did Christian Europe continue to teach Greek mythology? Right? The, the Odyssey and, you know, uh, Homer and the, the, the gods of the Olympus and stuff like that. Isn't that considered shirk for monotheists? Why did they keep teaching Greek mythology, even in Christian times and Christian schools? And then it suddenly dawned on me. They don't teach it because of the aqidah in it. They teach it because of the lessons. Because these are timeless, incredible lessons. All right. Now, in modern times, modern academia made it where <clears throat> we have to teach history based on fact. Napoleon went to this city on that date, on this year, and he killed 17 people, and he did this and that. History has just become an exposition of fact. Do you, did you learn anything? Nothing. Islamic scholars were actually so ahead of their times. Because when it came to hadith, they were very careful with the authentication. But when it came to, to the documentation of history, they were a lot looser. They would allow, you know, sort of like all these kinds of stories to be included in sirah because they were instructed, because they were important, they were moral, they taught people something. So I would rather that we teach people history that is not true as long as they learn lessons from it than to teach them history that is absolutely factual. But they're not really gaining anything from it. And let me inshallah wrap it up here. 
about the book itself. You know, event tonight has is not a promotion, by the way, of this book. I just wanted to make sure because, you know, the Bay Area literally is the only place away from Sacramento that I visit occasionally. So I wanted to make sure that, you know, this is an extension of my own community. And I wanted to make sure that you know that this resource does exist and that you are able to use it, inshallah, when you need to. So you don't need to go on Amazon and buy the book right now, but you just need to know that the book is there. If you've ever needed it, the resource is available, all right? So the premise of the book is simple. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I've always been inspired by Socrates. I've, I've loved his faith, his love for God. And, you know, some Muslim scholars actually believe that Socrates was the prophet for the Greek people, which is really interesting. His student, Plato, wanted to eternalize the teachings of his own teacher, so he wrote this incredible book that is called Plato's Republic, if you guys are familiar with that book. This is, this is a very important classical work. I studied it when I was gra in, in grad school. So in Plato's Republic, Plato creates fictional conversations between his teacher, Socrates, and random people in the community that come ask Socrates questions about justice and God and so forth. And, and through his own words, he tries to emphasize the spirit of Socrates' you know, teachings and so forth. So when I decided to write this book, I wanted to model it after Plato's Republic. So instead of writing prose paragraph after paragraph, make it dry, <coughs> inaccessible, I decided to create a conversation. <coughs> so it's basically a dialogue between a fictional imam, not me particularly, a fictional imam and a fictional member of the community whose nephew lost his faith. The man is very furious, so he comes to the imam seeking guidance, and the imam talks to the uncle, and the uncle goes and talks to the nephew, and at the very end of the book, all the arguments for God have been covered, and the nephew requests to meet with the imam. And I leave it on a cliffhanger, you know, so to speak. Um, because I don't want to give people false hope either. Oh my God, you just follow these steps and read the book, and all the atheists are coming come in, into the fold of Islam. It doesn't work this way, right? You have to invest, and it takes time. And at the end of the day, You don't guide those whom you love. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide their hearts if he so wills. All right? Um, my desire, hopefully, inshallah ta'ala, with our local community, I'm not interested in making big changes in the world. Just the community where I'm raising my kids. That's what matters to me. Right? So Northern California is my community. And I'm hoping, inshallah ta'ala, that we're going to be able to, to create a generation whose faith is fortified against the arguments of atheism so that acts of worship become meaningful. When you recite the Qur'an, you cry, it's meaningful. When you make your sujood, it's meaningful. When you see the Kaaba and you get emotional, it's meaningful. If the mind is restless, you can't enjoy your acts of worship. Because the idea of losing your faith looms over your head. So I want to I wanna help fortify this generation, inshallah ta'ala, so that you know, their faith is strong enough and they're able to, to, to face the threat of atheism out there. And here's the thing, and I will end with this thought. There is so much... Uh, thirst for religion in America today. Judaism has exhausted its purposes and has unfortunately involved itself in the worst upper tide that history had ever seen. Christianity has technically and essentially exhausted its purposes. With all due respect, by the way, to our peace-loving Jewish and, Muslim and Christian neighbors, you know, this is not an attack on anyone. I'm just stating, you know, my own assessments of reality. Uh, modern American Christianity has completely lost its purposes because it's either that they are very liberal and they've allowed for all kinds of things that are antithetical to religion, ordaining gay pastors and anything goes, or they've become super conservative and evangelical and hateful of everyone else that is not them. Okay? Now, sooner or later, Americans are going to want to come back to spirituality. And who are they going to find? They're going to find Islam. My theory, I hope inshallah ta'ala I'm right about this, is that within the next 50 years, Americans are going to be converting to Islam en masse with the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We just have to be ready when that day comes. If he saves someone from atheism, they're not going to go back to Judaism and Christianity. They're going to come to Islam. Because that's going to become the only viable option. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it so. Zakallah here for your patience. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our hearts and our faith and our children. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to gather us in the highest level of Jannah. 
اقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ان شاء الله اعطيك some questions if you guys have any. السلام عليكم. Um, so my question is like you addressed a lot of concepts like related to atheism like on college campuses and those circles now you found, find more the ideas of like perennialism where people like were spiritual but not religious and they did not have the problem with the first part of Akida believing in God where like hey like you know we believe in God like makes sense but like how do we know that this is the right way to go and that's where they stumble they say hey like all these religions have some aspect of truth to it so why don't we just take the like good things from all the religions right and why do we have to go with one specific religion I actually do address perennialism briefly <clears throat> I think in the chapter before last in the book um, and I talk about the necessity of choice and I talk about uh, inclusivists and exclusivists inclusivists who say you know all religions have truth in them and why that idea does not make any sense and I talk about exclusivism why it doesn't make any sense either and I even talk about the hybrid edition which is people that think that they are in the middle between inclusivism and exclusivism and I present a fourth path that you know I believe inshallah leads to Islam you know, so you, you probably have to go a little bit in depth, you know, when, when you uh, take a look at the book. Uh, but that has to be addressed as well. And, and by the way, you know, this particular book project focuses primarily on making a case for God and, and secondarily on making a case for Islam. Like I think, I think at some point, inshallah, I probably need to write another book project. You know, that will be a continuation of this. Okay, now we have God. Why do we have to choose Islam kind of thing? Yeah. Sister? Next. <coughs> Assalamu alaikum. Um, you mentioned or you listed very important points about the main causes or what you identified as the main causes for atheism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not sure if you noticed that the absence of Arabic understanding of the Quran, like to understand it fresh. And I met some Hafiz who became unfortunately atheists. Uh, and when I looked in, into what's happening, I found that, okay, they memorized the whole Quran, but they didn't really understand it fresh. And if they wanted to understand it, they have to go and read it in some form of translation, um, and especially in this community. Because in other, like, let's say, majority Muslim countries or Muslim countries, the person has many guards to guard him from atheism. The community, the people, uh, the street, friends, everywhere. But when we send our kids out there, they memorize a little bit of a Quran and some Hadith, and for them, they go out and they meet other people from different faiths, and then the Quran for them is just rituals, it's just songs, right. it's just things that my father is saying, they sing, it sounds nice, but they don't have that God if they don't understand it. I'm not sure if, if you had that notice as well. Um, so the question about the Arabic language, uh, I, I tell you what I personally do, you know, I. Everyone that studies with me, I require them to study Arabic as well. Because I think that this is the key to accessing authentic Islamic knowledge. All right? So you cannot, you cannot grow in your Islamic knowledge without the, the Arabic language. I think that's, that's a given. Uh, does it affect faith or not? You know, to not have access to the Arabic language, I think that is something that has to be studied uh, quite academically. Uh, I, I will say, however, that there is a rise of atheism in the Arab world. There is now all kinds of discussion groups and Facebook groups, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. You know, and, and I speak, you know, I, I'm of Egyptian descent myself, I'll speak to that. Uh, you know, there's so many groups now in, in Egypt and other, you know, uh, Arab countries that are entirely atheist. And they're becoming more vocal by the day. And so I think far gone are the days when we thought that, you know, growing up in a Muslim country would somehow automatically protect your faith. I think that's, that's way behind us now. This fire is coming to everyone. The flood is, is you know, we don't want to be like Nuh's son and think that the water is not going to come to, to our mountain, right? Because it seems like it's, it's everywhere and we need to get smart about this for sure. Next. Sister is right over there, brother. Sorry. I've been trying. <laughs> I really liked your point about how you were able to talk to your, your own child. Um, but I was wondering, how do you kind of envision a community where teenagers feel comfortable in asking questions um, without feeling that like they wouldn't be judged? Because not a lot of kids 
may feel uncomfortable asking their parents these questions. Uh-huh. What do you think like attracts like teenagers to those spaces? Girls and boys it might might be different. I, I think it's it's about creating a culture, and that culture starts at home. It starts with encouraging debates and encouraging doubts, and telling the kids when they come with doubts, guys, that's perfectly normal. I feel I have doubts myself, you know, once in a while. It's okay. We're all seekers of the truth. And, and, and if you don't know the answer, tell them, you know what? Let's both of us, yeah, actually, that's a, that's a really important question. Let's go and talk to maybe, I don't know, the imam or some learned person in the community that has, uh, uh, has knowledge to answer that question. One of the things that I've personally done, and, I, and I, it's replicable, but you know, I think it's not easy, is that I conducted a class. So there is, so what, what I've done is that I used like a three-pronged approach. I, I wrote the book, and I know that the book, Muslims are not readers, and I say that with respect, but it's an unfortunate truth that a lot of Muslims don't read. You know, I, I am an avid reader myself. You know, I always have a bunch of books next to my bed, and I have to read at least 15 minutes every single day. Otherwise, I'll feel like my brain is rusty. And so Muslims need to read, but I know that most of them don't read. So the book is not going to serve that many people. So I decided to conduct a class, and, and it was a year-long class, three semesters, and it was, I think, about... 30 sessions, two hours each, in which I covered the entire content of the book. And that became a, a material that is offered actually at the Tarbiya Seminary program. So you can sign up for it and, and, and kind of watch the videos uh, uh, remotely. Uh, and then in addition to that, I decided to popularize the knowledge itself. And we created a, a YouTube series of 10 videos that actually address the concepts of the book so that we expand you know, the culture <clears throat> as much as possible in our own community. Uh, so I think that maybe the Bay Area probably needs to do something similar to that. These are you know, the three steps that, are, that we've taken. Uh, sister? Yeah, <coughs> very enlightening right. uh, talk. Um, in your experience, who do you think is behind this uh, organized effort to malign our young people? Is shaitan, it? sister. <laughs> so, yes. But <laughs> at the same time, shaitan and also our own family environment uh, is uh, inclusive in this. Definitely. Way. I mean, again, you know, in the shaitana, lakum aduun, fattakhiduhu aduun. You know, he's, he's the enemy. Treat him as such. Sometimes we say that shaitan is the enemy, but we're, we're, we're doing his bidding and following in his, in, in his footsteps and doing his work, right? So accept him intellectually as the enemy and then start acting accordingly that he is your enemy. And once you've accepted that, you realize that there are people who work for shaitan. You know, there are people who, who are, are the, the agents of shaitan in this dunya and, and, and they, you know, by consequence become our enemies as well. And, and, and I'm not saying there's a particular faith group or a particular corporation or whatever. I'm just saying anyone that does the work of shaitan becomes our enemy. But I, I refrain from saying that there's some, some kind of a, of, a, of a conspiracy, you know, against faith. You know, it's just people who have lost faith and they project that weakness on people who have faith because, you know, misery uh, requires a company. And they don't want to be, it's like, uh, you know, Lut alayhi salam, akhrijo ala lutum min qariyatikum, innahum unasun yatataharun. These are clean people, get them out of here, they make us all look bad. So, people who don't have faith, they are threatened and challenged by people who do have faith because they see their peace and, and, and they miss that peace so much. So, what's the way out? It's to extinguish your peace as well. So, we're all miserable in the same abyss together, right? So, So one thing you said really resonated me. Uh, it was, if you if your ch- children think you're intellectually inferior to them, you're dead to them as a parent. How do you, uh, as a parent, equip yourself? Uh, you know, this book is a start, but let's say you need to go deeper. Uh, how would you like? What are some steps you've done, or for or for the average Muslim who can't go down the scholarly route? Uh, what steps should you think they should take? Just you know, read more books on various topics. Uh, like, how would you how would you these parents to address their own, uh, that's, a, that's a great question and again I'm not I'm not saying every parent needs to be a scholar in their own right in order to achieve that you just 
cannot afford to come across as an unsophisticated person, simplistic, quick to judge, quick to make unverified and uncorroborated statements, uh, you know, easy to believe things, you know, uh, accept conspiracy theories, right? These outlandish statements that some parents make, they really end up doing them a tremendous amount of disservice, and it doesn't help, you know, our kids. We have to be reasonable. We have to find, you know, use logic, you know, take it easy, process the information first, you know. So it's a behavioral, it's a behavioral thing first and foremost, right? And once I think we've fixed the behavioral component of this, then it becomes a matter of learning, right? You have to just be like, on average, aware of what is happening in the world around you. When, when your kids say, you know, a name of a country, and you say, I've never heard that country. There's a country that, that exists? Oh my God, Sacramento is the capital of California? What? I thought it was San Diego. Like, things like that, that would just make you look so stupid in front of your kids, That's this is the stuff that you have to avoid. And so, an average amount of awareness and knowledge will get you there. You don't need to, to, to develop a PhD. But if you are so averse to learning yourself, you don't want to learn, you don't want to grow, you don't want to read, you don't want to listen to the lectures, you, you have no in, desire whatsoever to grow intellectually and spiritually, then obviously that's going to reflect in the way you treat your own kids. So we're not asking for a miracle here. We're just asking for a little effort for us to be at least a couple of steps ahead of our kids. This is I always say to my children, like, I will always be at least a mile ahead of you guys. And, and they know that. They, they believe it. They wholeheartedly believe it. You know, there's, just, there's no way that we're going to get this man. Right? Because I've created that illusion at home. And now they believe it. You know, they try to corner me. I get them. And I don't lose my temper either. Right? So at home, I've, I, I've made a deal with my kids. If you use logical steps and you make a strong case, I will always yield. Every single time I kept my word, 99% of the time I win, by the times they do win, I acknowledge it. And I said, you know what? You're right. We're going to change the course, and I'm following your plan. That right there does wonders for the children. I think there was a, a hand right there, and then... <coughs> uh, just uh, thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. Uh, small advice for my brother and sister that uh, I, I tried with my kids. Um, one of the ways to open them for just a discussion and to encourage them to talk about things that they have questions about, I tell them, you're doing what Sayyidina Ibrahim was doing. Arini kaifa tuhi al-mawta. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's, that's, that's something that get them to ask questions. And same thing with, uh, with Sayyidina Musa when, when he said, Arini uh, anzur mm. ulayk. So things that in my mind, when I grow up, you cannot ask these questions, but actually, it realistically, prophets ask that question similar right. to that. So it's good right. to open questions with the family members, and it's actually, don't disencourage them, but actually, actually giving them stories that can help them to open. That's a great questions. point. I appreciate that. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Um, I see a much more common, more than atheism in, in a community. People come to pray, they even fast and everything. Much more agnostic. And this is very common, especially in college. They say, well, I am a Muslim, but I don't know. Uh, there's some kind of doubt. Some, they believe in something, but, but they can't say precisely 100% this is my God or this is it. So this is very common even I, when I travel around the world. I see mostly... And college level, even the universities, this is... So what do you think about this agnostic kind of thoughts? Bismillah. Yes, I, I do agree that agnosticism is, is just as big a problem as atheism. But here's the thing. Agnosticism is actually more honest than atheism. Because agnostics, at least, they have the humility to say, I'm just withholding judgment, I don't know. Right? Atheists, on the other hand, they straight up tell you, God doesn't exist. So wait a second, my faith is that God exists. Your faith is that God doesn't exist. We're just flip coins of the same thing. Right? So atheism, by definition, is the absolute most dishonest enterprise. Agnosticism is something that I'm actually willing to engage with. And so, remember what I said earlier? between making God into a great plausibility 
versus God being a great necessity. Remember that discussion that I mentioned earlier, right? If you can show that God is a necessity, you know what, that's fine. Then at least you've addressed the, 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 the problem that agnostics have. But I think what works most of the time, you know, in my own dealings with agnostics, is that all I need to do is to not only make God into a great plausibility, but to, to make God into something that is very, very likely. Even if we don't establish that God is a necessity. At which point it just becomes easier and more commonsensical to follow something that is more likely than not. All right? And, and the rest, by, once you've reached that point with them in understanding, the rest just becomes the work of the heart. It becomes the work of emotions. The work of friends and support system. And, and who they're spending their time with and having dinner with and, and, and the type of environment that they're surrounded with, this is what is going to bring them back gradually into the faith, you know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. <coughs> so, Star's question. Uh, do we have any number for what percentage of Muslims go to either a full time Islamic school or? Weekend Islamic school. Um, I don't know if I have those numbers myself, but if I were to guess, I would say it's a very small percentage. So I think it, the, the, the statistics came out about about 10 years ago uh, with, the, with the Pew Center that about 10% of American Muslims attend Salatul Eid. About ten percent. So if you have if you have ten thousand people coming to Salatul Eid, that means there's a hundred thousand Muslims in the city, roughly speaking. Right now, you do the math. Out of ten thousand people who come to Salatul Eid, how many come to Taraweeh? Maybe like about one third, I would say, one quarter, perhaps. So maybe about twenty five hundred. And out of the twenty five hundred who come to you know, uh, uh, Salat al-Taraweeh regularly, how many would actually come to Jum'ah regularly? Honestly, about a thousand, right? And out of the one thousand that come to Jum'ah regularly, how many of them are devout Muslim families that actually send their kids to Sunday school? Maybe significantly less. I want to say about maybe 200 of them. And so again, these are rough numbers depending on an area of a, of a Muslim population of about 100,000, all right? So my guess is that the percentage is very, very low. Very, very, very low. Jazakallah <coughs> khair, Sheikh Abdul Aziz, for your wonderful evening. Thank you. I hope the audience enjoyed a lot. But this, Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Allahumma ja'al jam'ana hadha jam'an marhuma. Waj'al tafarruqana min ba'dihi tafarruqan ma'asuma. Wa la taj'al ma'ana wa la baynana shaqiyan wa la mahruma. ولا مطرودا من رحمتك أرحم الراحمين سبحانك اللهم بحمدك شر ولا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم العصر الإنسان في خصر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله